and my greetings from Bangalore to all the people who are attending these functions and the, all the students and alumni of Ari College and NIIT, because I, I more fondly call it Ari College, but it has become now NIIT. The screen here you see is, of course, my current institute where I spent 45 years. Uh, this is the uh, 35 years, not 45. Uh, this is Indian Institute of Science. And what I am going to talk about is work done here. And I'm going to talk about aluminum super alloys for high strength and high temperature applications. As I go forward with this talk, you'll realize what I am talking about. Of course, I'm talking about aluminum. It has a periodic table, it is a 13, and it has an atomic weight of 26.982. Because everything starts with a periodic table. And if you look at a little bit of history, it was discovered by Hans Oersted, the same physicist who has done many other things in 1825. So it is unlike iron, copper, zinc, it is a very new metal. About 200 years back, its existence were not known. But today, it is one of the most important of all metals. It has a melting point of 660, but more importantly, it has a density of 2.7 gram per cc. And that is why the importance of aluminum comes in. That it is low density materials with a reasonable melting point, not too high, but density is a big advantage. If you look at what is happening in modern technology, whether it is aerospace, whether it is rockets, whether it is automotive body, or whether it is an engine, or it is a current carrying conductors. Aluminum plays a very, very big role. You cannot have this modern technology without aluminum. And that is a, a very, very successful journey in last slightly less than 200 years. But all these things would not have been possible without these two gentlemen. In fact, extracting aluminum was difficult even after its discovery in 1825. People tried to extract it, chemists tried to extract it with the reductions using sodium, potassium in a very complicated route and therefore it became expensive. It is so expensive that there was an exhibition where Napoleon's crown was exhibited in Paris, and next to the crown, the next exhibit was a piece of aluminum. So it was almost like a jewelry value. But oh, everything changed because of these two persons, Charles Martin Hall, and of course, the Herald, Paul Herald. Interesting, both of them born in 1863, and both of them died in 1914. And both of them discovered extraction of aluminum in an industrial scale independently. And for the students who are here, I'd like to point out that both of them discovered this process when they were of the age 22. 22 years old, independently, in USA and in Paris, they discover, in, in France, they discover the extraction of aluminum. And what a, what a marvelous and wonderful process they have developed. It has changed metallurgy in many ways. We knew before this time that most of the extraction is done by reductions 
thermal reductions that requires high temperature, that requires a reductant at high temperature, and therefore you reduce it and produce like iron. What these two people did is that they reduced ore of alumina, basically a pure alumina, but they reduced it by electrolytic means. What they have done, they took alumina, L2O3, and dissolved, but alumina is non-conducting, it cannot conduct easily, and it is a very high melting point material. How do how do make an electrolyte out of it? So they dissolve it in cryolite, made graphite as the anode, cathode also is a graphite, pass current, and heated the whole thing to a joule heating. The aluminum got L2 got reduced, reacted with the carbon in the anode, produced CO2 and molten aluminum because this cell operate at a high temperature above the melting point of aluminum. So the reduced aluminum drop by drop comes to the cathode and produce a molten aluminum pool. And that aluminum is tapped away. A wonderful and relatively clean way of reducing aluminum. And it was so successful that next 150 years, we have a, I can easily say, era of aluminum. But it would not have been possible, but for another discovery by a German metallurgist, Alfred Wilms. He lived in 1869 to 1937. In 1901, during the war period, he joined a company and he was tasked to make aluminum alloy stronger. Aluminum copper alloy at that time was very weak. So how we can make it stronger so that it can be used in a gun. And he tried many things and 1903 in one Friday afternoon, he and his assistant made the aluminum 3.4% 3 copper and he added to it a mixture, equal mixture of manganese and magnesium about 1%. He put it out of furnace, but could not observe it. They could only observe immediately after that one reading and found it is very soft. But weekend and they are young. So they went away. And in fact, Wilms was yachting next two days in the sea and came back next Monday. And when they measured, they found they have a very strong. Presence. And that is the discovery of age hardening, which has revolutionized the aluminum technology, the aluminum alloys that we see today. Let us move forward. So over the next last 100 years, 110 years, a lot of work has been done to develop this aluminum alloys, and it is a roaring commercial su success. And one of the strongest alloy that has been developed is 7075. So one may think that research on aluminum has come to an end. But fortunately for us, it is not so. Last about 15 years, a new development took place, started by Northwest University of North uh, in Chicago, Northwestern University at Chicago by Paul Sedman and his groups. I'll come to that later. And later on, we did very 
extensive work in the last 10 years. And IIC is today at the cutting edge of these developments, and I'll be going to tell you the story of our work to develop these alloys. It has not yet come to the commercial, but it is knocking on the verge of coming to commercial. We know that super alloys are developed by nanostructuring of precipitates that impart high strength and high temperature stability. The high temperature stability is a very important. There are many, many alloys which gives high strength, but they are not stable at high temperature. So they cannot be used for a, any long period of time at high temperature. Now there is basically the most important super alloy was nickel based super alloys, which all we all know. Last 15, 20 years, 15 years basically, we also have seen the rise of cobalt super alloys. But that story I will not tell today, some other day, I think I will talk about the story of development of cobalt based super alloys. But today we will be talking about aluminium alloy and which recently, last one year, one and a half years, people are terming it as aluminum super alloys because principles are very similar for developing these alloys. Let us look at basics a little bit. I will not talk too much of a time, but a little bit of basics. Any material, if you want to pull it, there is a bond between atoms. And they actually bring together the atoms in a, in a solid. And this we call it as a cohesive energy. And if you can pull a metal, and it, if you want to pull a metal and take it apart, you have to break all these bonds. And you can model this bond in a classical way by putting a ball and spring. And immediately you see that if you take a ball and spring models, that if you make bring them too close, there's a repulsion. If you take them too far, then actually again they, they lose. So this repulsive energy and attractive energy together they balance and then there is a minimum positions they remain. And this is the for energy that you require is called cohesive energy and it is very strong. If it is only cohesive energy, then most of the material would have been a very strong material. And you could not have formed any of these in any shape easily. However, fortunately, nature has a clever way. They don't break all the bonds. They break the bond one by one. And that is the, by the motions of a defect, dislocations. And this is a typical way that one by one bond breaks. And what here right hand side you see is that along the dislocation line, you are looking at edge dislocations. And again, you see that bond breaks one by one. So the energy requirement to deform a material deform a metals or alloys is not the energy that is required to break a cohesive energy bond, but much less. And that is the beauty of a metals and alloys. And once this dislocation sweeps in, you can see the right hand side, it produces a displacement. And that is why we can roll, we can form metals with a much lower energy. But that energy should be not too low. If you want to have a strong material, a high energy, that energy should be reasonably high. So basically the game is that, uh, how do you strengthen an alloy? This boils down to how do you block the motion of the dislocations? Whole metallurgy of alloy development and mechanical metallurgy is based on how we can block the motion of the dislocations reasonably well. And there are many ways you can do it. 
And I have shown you in the left hand side few ways. One is if you put a solute atoms here, it is a solid solution. And because the external atom that we are putting in the base, base matrix is of different size, it distorts the bonds around it in the matrix. And when the distortion moves in through it, it requires additional energy because of this dis distortion. And this is the reality. You can see that this is an aluminum matrix, basically a solid solution matrix. And you can see that some of that, this is atomic image, and some of them are bright. They are the solute atoms. And if the dislocation has go, go if dislocation goes through this matrix, these solute atoms around them, they will have a strength field, and therefore it will put a hindrance to the motion of the dislocations. You can also do it by putting a dispersion or a precipitate. You can put it in many ways. You can put the dispersions or a precipitate very closely or, or very widely, and they will have a different effect. Dispersion itself is just another phase. Therefore, they have a different modulus. So when a dislocation is moving, dislocation energy, I am not talking about detail, but it has a modulus term. So if it encounter a material with a different modulus, it requires additional energy to overcome that. That is why even if you have vacancies, even if you have a, for example, if you do a radiations, there's a term called radiation hardening, where very fine voids are created all across the material and strengthen the material. And that is actually the modulus hardening. The distribution faces a different modulus. However, we can also precipitate a second phase in solid state. And the nucleation kinetics of solid state precipitation is such, even without getting into detail, that they'll have an interface which try to match it with the matrix lattice. For example, this is a plate precipitate, the theta prime, in the aluminum copper alloys. And this is a atomic resolution precipitate uh, imaging done at our facility, microscope facility. And you can see that this, this bright things are copper, copper atom column. And this is the matrix, the, uh, it is it's embedded in the matrix. And if you look at, go along any of the lattice, the row of atoms, you'll find that the row continues here also in the precipitate. That means they're completely coherent. Although they are different from the matrix, they are a different phase, but they have a completely coherent. So once a dislocation try to pass through, they have to cut through it if they are very close. And this is a typical example of cutting through this. For example, dislocation is cutting through this precipitate. But of course, if they are very well separated and big, then dislocation is very clever. You can loop through it. And this is called R1 looping. And of course, the best trend comes when the separation is very small. And therefore, if you have a nanometric particles with a small separations uniformly distributed, you strengthen it, the materials much more. Then precipitate will disperse and will separate. Of course, there are grain boundaries, but I'll not talk about it because we can define the grain boundary, make things stronger, but high temperature, they are not very useful because grain growth will take place. So actually the game is for high temperature material is, why do we have to do it is because all this mechanism I have talked about, the effect is, effectiveness of these reduces at high temperature. Therefore, you can design a conventional design of high strength alloys with all these 
barrier to dislocations, but they often fail at high temperature. High temperature design of materials, which also will have high strength, requires more innovations, more innovativeness. There are ways to design such alloys. And this is the lesson that people learn from nickel based super alloys. Because nickel based super alloys, the nickel alloy has been strengthened by an ordered gamma prime precipitate, which is a, a ordered version, FCC ordered, jargon wise, it's called L1 to ordered version, which is completely coherent with the matrix. And therefore, high temperature, it does not deteriorate its properties. And because it's ordered, it is strong. So as long as your temperature is not above the order is for the transition temperature, you can use this for strengthening your, your alloy and it does not destabilize with temperature. So we have utilized this concept of order hardening and control of nucleation to impart strength both at room and high temperatures in the last seven, eight years at Indian Institute of Science. And that is a story I'm going to tell you to develop how we can use that to develop high strength, high temperature aluminum alloys. Of course, this is what I have already talked to you. This is how we strengthen nickel based super alloys. You can see gamma, the FCC matrix, and you see gamma prime, the order matrix, and you can see the interface is completely coherent. You can walk in through any of these lines that is called lattice, and you'll walk into straight without any hindrance into the gamma prime lattice. And therefore, there's no bond breaking at the interface. Therefore, it is very low energy. And if it's a very low energy, high temperature, it is stable. And this is what we have utilized for all nickel based super alloys which drives our aerospace industries. Why it happens? Why it, uh, it retains and increases strength, this order coherent boundaries? It is because in this case, if dislocation moves, this is a trace of this dotted line that you see in the my cursor. This is a trace of one on one slip plane where dislocation moves. And when the skewed dislocation has to move through order things, it dissociate and in between there's an antiphase boundary. So it has a two component, one trailing dislocations and one is a forward dislocations separated by antiphase boundary. Basically what it does, it when it goes through the order matrix, it breaks the order. And then the trailing dislocations, they store the order. So that is what is the concept of super dislocations. But often what it does that it can cross slip into another plane. For example, in this case, one zero zero plane. So this pair, one of them moves into the other slip plane. Therefore, they face a difficulty. They have to move together, but one of them is in another slip plane. And this is called lock. And this lock forms in order material. So when a dislocation moves through it, it, it produces a complex arrangement. First, it produces, it cannot go single. It has to produce a pair. Actual pair is a very simple thing. It can produce even more complicated arrangements depending on stacking fault energy and antiphase boundary energies. And then it moves to the other planes, a part of it, and it produces a various type of locks, and therefore dislocation doesn't move. If dislocation doesn't move, it has tendons. So when dislocation try to move through the order precipitate, it cannot move, and therefore they act as a strengthener. This is called order hardening. Now, if we can use this order hardening also to develop aluminum super alloys together with precipitate hardening. 
And that is the whole game that you play in developing aluminum superalloys. Our work actually started quite some time back, about 10, 12 years back, when Boeing company came to Indian Institute of Science and they wanted to have a very strong collaboration with the IISC. They wanted to open up a center at IISC, first one outside USA. So I was that time a division chairman, so we coordinated with many, many other departments and they developed a very big program. At the end of the pro discussions, when everything is final, Dr. K. Shankaran, one of the alumni of Durgapur, came to my room. He is a one year senior to me. Came to my room and said, "Come on, you. I want to want you to try something. I want you to try to develop aluminum alloys, which can give a 200 megapascal strength at 250 degree centigrade." I told Shankaran, why you are doing this to me? Nobody in the world has, could do it. You know it will be failure. But those of you who know Shankaran, he gave a smile and said, doesn't matter if you fail, but at least give a try. I think you can give a try. And here is the money. And this money will not take back if you fail. So he has given a 40 million four crore funding. And of course, after three years, we failed. We tried all sorts of things they are at and all those things, but we didn't succeed in the first go. But he kept his promise and he kept the money and we kept working on it. And ultimately we succeeded and there is a patent U.S. patent, Indian patent, and now many, many things have followed. So let me talk about that. We know that aluminum copper system has precipitates, and it has a very high solvous temperature. This is ideal for high temperature strength. However, rapid coarsening occurs at high temperature, and it ruins the body. If you look at the phase diagram, the solvent temperature at 4% of copper is almost 500 degree. So classically, we strengthen it by solutionizing in the alpha aluminum solution regime, then quench it, and then we age it in any of these temperatures, and we form a precipitate. So why can't we, if, you, if anybody asks, that why can't we get a 500 degree or 400 degree centigrade operating temperature from aluminum alloys? Because there can be a precipitate. The answer is yes, that can be a precipitate, but it cannot work. Actually, aluminum alloys produces a very interesting set of precipitates, completely coherent, what is we call GP zone clustering. Then we have a two sets of precipitates. Technically, it is known as a theta prime and theta double prime. And this lines that I have given in this diagram is solvous. Above this, this precipitate dissolve. So you can see if your aluminum matrix is strengthened by theta prime precipitates, equilibrium theta precipitate does not strengthen that much because they are not so coherent. But theta prime is quite coherent. Theta double prime is extremely coherent. And therefore, matrix is very, the, uh, the, all these are very stable. But, and they can actually, so you can have a materials which will strengthen the aluminum alloys. Theta prime can strengthen the aluminum alloys at least up to 300, 350 degrees centigrade. But as I've told you, above 150 degrees centigrade, it coarsens. So these are the plates that you can see in the aluminum matrix, and they are either theta or theta double prime. In these microstructures, you have both of them. 
and they strengthen, but you can use it up to 150 degrees centigrade. Later, I'll show you how crazily they coarsen uh, in a later slides. So what we said that why don't we use the principle of super halide order hunting and use zirconium, which we know produce an ordered L3X L1 to phase, same crystal structure that you find in a nickel based super alloys, and precipitate it out because this phase precipitates a very high temperature. So, this is a zirconium, aluminum zirconium alloys with zirconium precipitated out, fine distribution. But unfortunately, this precipitate volume fraction is low, so they do not make much of a strength. So we, why don't we add zirconium and aluminum copper and do a conventional heat treatment? Of course, we can do that. But temperature difference, where zirconium precipitate and the aluminum copper precipitate is very large. And if you just solutionize it and try to precipitate first zirconium around 450 degrees centigrade, and then uh, do, what happens is that when you solutionize it, this alma copper alloy, zirconium start precipitating and they become coarser. So you cannot get a strength. And therefore, classically, just zirconium addition doesn't work. So what do I do? And this is where actually our innovation came in. What we said is that, okay, you put zirconium and we have also put niobium. I'll come to that later. You chill cast it, you get in got cast structure of aluminum copper with zirconium with a lot of segregations, but we don't solutionize it where zirconium will come out and make a coarse precipitate. We precipitate out zirconium at a lower temperature of 400 degrees centigrade, 10 hours. Then we take the whole thing up to solutionizing temperature and solutionize it at a short time because zirconium is a slow diffusing element. So l as a precipitate does not dissolve easily, does not coarsen easily once formed. So only short time and copper get dissolved. Then we quench and edge. So what happens if we do that? So this is what happens. This is a cast structure. You can see the segregations. It has a copper, it has a zirconium. You do 400 degrees centigrade, 10 hours. You think that this segregation decreases because zirconium has now precipitated out. If you look at it at a higher tools, like a transmission electron microscope, you see L3Z order precipitate with the diffraction patterns where you see the super lattice spot. You can also do a atom probe and you can see that L3Z precipitate. Then you solutionize and entire copper has gone into it, but zirconium precipitate did not coarsen much. So you quench it. Same story in the atom probe. So you quench it and then age it. And you get this beautiful structure. This is beautiful because this plate that you see here is the plate of theta prime. This plate is famous for strengthening aluminum alloys. But you see that every plate has nucleated on a L3 as a precipitate. You can see it more clearly in the right hand high resolution image on the TM. So this is not a normal copper precipitate. This is heterogeneously nucleated precipitate, nucleated by earlier precipitate of ordered l 3 And if you do a diffraction analysis, you can see that theta prime and theta double prime, depending upon the aging, and you also see the L1 to precipitate reflections. 
So you can do a tomography on this. Atom probe tomography, the latest in characterizing such materials. And you can see beautifully, these are the plate of aluminum copper theta prime. And each plate is, is actual plates that each, the red color is the L3 is the order precipitate, and they actually, uh, this order precipitate is surrounded by these plates. This is more clearly shown here. The middle one is the L1 to order precipitate, and on it, nucleated the aluminum copper plates. And this is a unique arrangement which resists coarsening and impart very high strength. It resists the dislocation motions, resists the coarsening, and gives a very high strength. You look at the tensor strength. This is aluminum copper, room temperature. This is only with a niobium and zirconium with no copper, it is not that strong. But when you put aluminum to copper and you put zirconium as well as small amount of niobium, it is very strong. It is about 540 UTS and 250 megapascal, uh, 460 megapascal yield strength. At 250, still it is very strong. It is still around 260. Therefore, the material at 250 degrees centigrade is still very strong with the 250 MPS strength. This is, if you remember, this is what challenge Boeing posed to us, which we saw. This is a comparison of all the alloys, 2219, 2024, 7075, and our alloy. Those of you who are first year, second year, this is jargon, but all metallurgy, other people will know that. 2219, 7075 is today the most important aluminum alloys used everywhere. But high temperature strength, if you look at, that is a green. This alloy surpasses every one of them. You can use it at high temperatures. But is it stable at long temperature? Does it resist coarsening? And so I'll show you a series of experiments kept at different times, at different temperatures. This is peak case microstructure of our alloy. If we keep that at 250 degrees centigrade at 50 hours, the core sense, and 300 degrees centigrade, 50 hours. You see, microstructure did not change too much. This, remember, look at the scale. This is actually finer. This is a 500 nanometer, this is a 200 nanometer. And if you don't add zirconium and niobium, this is how it looks. You can see that same heat treatment, it coarsens crazily. And at this temperature, it has no strength virtually. It's almost like a pure aluminum, the strength wise. And this is the coarsening rate. When I have zirconium and niobium, it doesn't coarsen. It coarsens very little, right? Do not say it doesn't. But other, other alloys, it coarsens very rapidly. We have also done a phase fill modeling in collaboration with Professor Shashad Bhattacharya at IIT Hyderabad, because I knew him for a long time from his IIT uh, Indian Institute of Science days. So he and his students have done wonderful phase fill simulations and confirmed what we see in the microstructure. His phase fill simulations and our microstructure is identical. And therefore, what we are talking about is correct. But you can ask why, why we are adding niobium. If we remove niobium, actually it happens same thing. You get same microstructures. And you can see this imaging here that this has only aluminum, copper, and zirconium that L3 Z are precipitates, and the theta prime precipitate has only copper. So it does not have an iron. So does it matter? 
why why should we want to use Nyabam into it? We look at the properties, tensor properties. Room temperature property, if we look at addition Nyabam, <coughs> strength increases. Then without Nyabam, 361 versus 416. High temperature, same story. 175 megapascal with niobium at 250 compared to 151 megapascal without niobium. If you look at cleat, which is the other most important properties, if you don't add niobium, this is a clip curve at 250 degrees centigrade. But if you add niobium, creep rate is much lower. And therefore, niobium does affect, and it does affect by partitioning partly in the theta prime phase. But I'll show you the reason, not with niobium, but similar effect happens when we add, instead of a niobium, tantalum. So this is a story of tantalum, identical. If you add tantalum to upper aluminum copper zirconium, you will get identical microstructures, the L1 to order precipitate, and on it, you nuclear the theta prime plate, and you increase the strength. This is the room temperature strength, the brick color is the for tantalum alloys and blue color is the aluminum copper zirconium alloys. So tantalum addition really improves. And this is high temperature strength. At 250 degrees centigrade, again, aluminum copper zirconium and aluminum copper zirconium plus tantalum, and again it improves. It also improves in the resistance to coarsening. This is the micro function of different. Almond copper alloys. You see, 100 hours they become very soft. It's about 80 megapascal. It's almost pure aluminum. This slightly more hardness, more than 100. It's about one. So that is remarkable. So hard it does. So we have now the state of our electron microscope as good as it can be anywhere in the world. This is Titan electron microscope with everything that is possible. Incidentally, many of those atom probe also is done in our place. We have state of art, one of the best atom probe in the world today. Now you see, this is the theta prime plate, sorry. And this is the matrix. And if you look at it, these are the column of atoms, site of copper, and these are the copper atoms, the bright one inside, the three row. But the outer one is brighter than the inside one and that is tantalum. This is done with a chemical resolved microscopy, high resolution microscopy. And these are red ones are aluminum, uh, copper sites. In the, in the, sorry, it is aluminum site in the matrix and they continue. Actually, some, some sections, the theta prime and Aluminium is very similar. So you can see those aluminum atoms here, but spacings are different. Inside three row, which is less strong, but strong enough, they are copper. But no zirconium here, because zirconium doesn't go to theta prime precipitate. But outside row is tantalum. As you can see, these strong peaks are tantalum, these peaks are copper, and 
inside ones, the small ones are aluminum. So you can establish that tantalum segregate at the interface of theta prime, and therefore theta prime does not coarsen, and therefore it retains its structure and coherency, and therefore it imparts the high strength. That's fine, but these are all cast. What about rot alloys? Can we produce a rot alloy out of it? In fact, this is a question posed to me when I was discussing these results to my friend. Now he's in IIT Hyderabad, IIT Bhuvaneshwar. Earlier he was in IIT Kharagpur, Professor Dinda. Professor Dinda said, you have to make rot alloys, otherwise it's useless. So we took up the challenge. How do I make the rot alloy? Simply eliminating the first heat treatment and doing a controlled hot rolling. Replacing the first heat treatment using a controlled hot rolling to precipitate out zirconium. So it becomes rot and it serves the purpose. And we monitor the optimum heat treatment by measuring the hardness. And when zirconium doesn't precipitate, it is still soft, but when zirconium starts precipitates, it is harder. So you optimized it and then look at the microstructure after rolling and you can see that we have the LCZ precipitates identical. And then we did a microscopy to see whether they are ordered 375. They are not ordered. We don't see any super lattice. It does not precipitate. 400 above, it precipitates. And then you do a aging at 100 degrees centigrade. That is standard aging temperature for copper alloys. We have done 20 hours. PKs, actually PKs tantalum after ship. 10 hours you get the PKs. And you see the identical microstructure that I have shown you earlier. This is the hard if image and this is the high resolution image. Therefore, as you can see, we can make the same alloys, and I have not given you the strength value. Strength values are identical as cast values, not much difference. And therefore, yes, it is possible to develop a rot alloys with these. Now, can we proceed further with these? I think I'm taking slightly longer time, but I'll, I'll quickly go through. Um, it's same concept and develop the other alloys. So from beginning of my research career, I was working on aluminum nickel eutectic. It's a beautiful eutectic structure, rod eutectic. But unlike silicon, this eutectic is not used too much because they have a reasonable strength because this is L3 and I, but they coarsen very rapidly. So they are no good. Then we told ourselves, can we add zirconium? small amount to strengthen the matrix and stop the coarsening. So we added a zirconium and you get a higher electrical microstructure. This is the lamella, l eutectic lamella. Look at TM. This is the l rods and alpha matrix. You look at even higher magnifications and you see matrix is full of l precipitate. You do atom probe, you confirm the compositions. So yes, it has formed. So what is the effect of it? Effect of it is that once you add zirconium, it does not coarsen. Top one is no zirconium and 100 hours at 400 degrees centigrade, you can see the blob of l It has no strength. Whereas if you add zirconium, micro slightly coarsens, but it retains the strength. I'm sorry, I think. Uh, Hello, sir. Sir. Sir, I think the video has been lagged.
Sir, you are not could audible, you, sir. Yes. Could you, could you see me, see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, okay. So actually, Microsoft team took me away and then brought me back. Okay, sir. Okay. So if, if, if you now look at the strength value, you look at it, which is economy added, room temperature strength, 350 megapascal, and 250 degree, 200 megapascal instant. So very high. And stability, you can see the difference. At bottom was aluminum, three nickel, without zirconium, top was zirconium. So you can develop a new series of cast eutectic alloys using the same principle, but why it is so with the addition of zirconium? To understand that, we have looked at the interface of l and aluminium in the atom probe. And Professor Surana Makinane has detected this. You see a segregation of zirconium at the l aluminum interface. And if you have a zirconium segregation at the interface, zirconium doesn't diffuse in aluminum easily. Zirconium is a big atom. And therefore, this interface is stable. It cannot coarsen, coarsening requires diffusion. And that is inhibited. And therefore, this alloy can be used at high temperature without any deterioration. And you look at creep, it is reflected in creep. This is the induction solidified aluminum nickel alloys, the blue. And the red one is with zirconium. And you can see at 250 degrees a creep, definitely creep is better than the induction solidified alloys. I, I just few more slides. I will not hold you people too long. I'll just tell you the very recent work that we are doing. This is work in progress that we can do same thing, not necessarily with zirconium, but with hopnium. Of course, hopnium is expensive, but doesn't matter. We can replace hopnium with something else. It's a proof of concept. But if we add 0 0.3 hopnium and aluminium, it precipitates. It precipitates a L12 structures. But this is a discontinuous precipitation, and it is no good because it will not stand them. But if we add silicon into it, this discontinuous precipitation stops, and we get a very uniform precipitation. And very fine distributions of five nanometer mod. And it definitely stand them, not very much, but it does stand them the matrix. So you decided to add copper, copper into it. And now this is the L3 is a precipitate in aluminum matrix with a hopnium and silicon. And you can see that if you do a, a high resolution EDS in a Titan, you see only hopnium and silicon in the precipitates. There's something more in this image, atomic resolution image, the column image. But I'll come to that in a later. This is the image, same thing. And this is the atomic resolution image with the chemical compositions of the column mapped on it. And you can see that there's a line here. And this is line is antiphase boundary. So this is the aluminum zirconium precipitate. L3 is ordered with the antiphase domain. And this reddish ones are actually site which is mixed. You have a hopnium and silicon, and yellow is a silicon. So they all have gone there. Now, this means something, which I will not discuss in detail, but I'll mention. This antiphase boundary in precipitates means that this precipitate is formed as a disorder solid solution during first stage of precipitation, and then it has immediately ordered. But that is only an interest for academician. And these are completely coherent, as you can see here in the column resolutions. And if you have a copper into it and precipitate, this is a copper precipitate. And again, it is doing the same story that 
L3 SI L1 to precipitate nucleating the theta prime and strength value 25 degree is fairly high. Actually, UTS is 500 megapascal and at 250 degree centigrade itself, you get about 250. And here you can I have compared with the other alloys and you can see for all alloys, this reddish ones show a higher strength. And therefore this is a, although hafnium is a expensive one, but this alloy is very strong by all means stronger than existing alloys. Again, why it is stable and why it is strong? And same story. You see solid solution strengthening because all these atoms are there all over. You see a very strong segregation of the interface of hopnium in the aluminum copper. Inside one is copper, but at the edge, at the interface, it is hafnium, and it is so uniformly distributed, segregated, that it cannot grow. It can grow only by step. So you can see as it tries to grow, it produces a step here. It produces a step here. So only step growth is possible because diffusion is very sluggish. So continuous diffusion growth is not possible. It can produce only step growth. And that is why it is stable, that is why it is strong, and that is why you get high strength. So this is a work in progress. And I hope I could show that you can get a high temperature, high strength aluminum alloys, which is called super alloys, because for 250 degrees centigrade and above aluminum alloys, it is a high temperature, like a, like a super alloys, and it is in the present day scenario, commercial, it is now touted. There's a company which has started trying to market it, and it is called High Temperature Aluminum Super Alloys. I must acknowledge my collaborators, Professor Subodh Kumar, Professor Makinani, and all the students who work on this, Prafil Shukla, Sam Ujjal, and wonderful facility at AFMM. Without them, it, it would not have been possible to do this work. Thank you very much.